Okay, hello, I am Lian Wan, the justice reporter of Lap Rappler, and I'm here to recap to you what happened during day two of the oral arguments of the anti-terror law that finished around 5.15 earlier. So, the day two started with a bombshell, supposed bombshell for, for from Solicitor General Jose Calida. When he was um, just about to enter his appearance to the court, um, he already said that he had a supervening event that will affect um, the oral arguments and the resolution of the entire case. And tell you, um, mind you, we, we there was a bit of a thriller about this because we had to wait before he could tell us what the supervening event was. He said he had video clips, he said he had transcripts and affidavits. It turned out that the NCIP and the Powell lawyers had reached the ITAS, uh, who are jailed under the anti-terror law in Olongapo, and the ITAS are withdrawing their petition for intervention, and that um, they supposedly said in their affidavits that they were forced, forced by the NUPL to sign the petition for intervention. Um, it's good to understand that this is a technique that the Solicitor General had used before. If you remember the writ of Calicasan case filed by the IBP on behalf of fishermen of Palawan and Zambales, um, the government was able to reach the fishermen and the fishermen withdrew their petition saying that they were forced. And soon after the IBP withdrew the entire petition, they didn't um, pursue the case anymore. So this was a technique that had worked before for Solicitor General Jose Calida. And he's doing it again for the anti-terror law. But he was cut by Chief Justice Justada Peralta because it turns out the Anbank earlier this morning had already unanimously dismissed the petition for intervention of the AITA. So that kind of diffused uh, the whole bombshell of Soljan Kalida, although it's not very clear to us at this point why the Supreme Court dismissed the petition for intervention and what effects that would have on the legal standing of the entire petition. So that was um, what uh, welcomed us in today to um, Justice Secretary Minardi Guevara said to expect fireworks and we really did see fireworks at the beginning of the oral arguments. For the substantive part of the oral arguments, uh, free speech took front and center in today's oral arguments. It started with Justice Marvik Leonen, who called to the rostrum again, um, UP Professor John Molo. If you remember last week's oral arguments, they had a steering exchange, the both of them, um, both from UP. So uh, for this for this interpolation, um, Justice Leonen asked Professor Molo about his most famous petitioner, which is retired Justice Antonio Carpio, who we all know is a staunch advocate for the West Philippine Sea and a staunch critic of China. And so very coyly, uh, Justice Leonen asked Professor Molo, when did Justice Carpio stop advocating for the West Philippine Sea? And Professor Molo had to ask him to repeat, uh, did you mean start or did you mean stop? And Justice Leonin said, stop. And Professor Molo said, he did not stop because we all know he's still continuing with his descent towards China and descent towards the Duterte government's policy towards China. Um, Justice Leonin's whole point was, if you're saying that there's a chilling effect on people, including your petitioners, then why is Justice Carpio able to continue expressing his dissent. Um, he, Justice Leonan made an entire example out of the UP professors like Professor J. Batong Bakal, Professor Ted Te, all pointing out that if you say that there's a chilling effect, then why are these people able to continue to express their criticism towards the, the, the Duterte government? And here is where Professor Molo said his um, rebuttal. He said, uh, to paraphrase him, chilling effect does not mean you have to chill an entire population. He said, chilling effect is just the pause that a writer takes when he writes the next word. Um, chilling effect is the hesitation in, in a speaker's mind before he utters the next word. Um, it, it is the fear inside a, the, the mind of a person that whatever he says next will open him up to prosecution under the anti-terror law. Um, Professor Molo ended that statement by saying, let me just read it so it's very accurate. Justice Scorpio is not afraid. That is true. He will never be afraid. But it would be another thing to suggest that there is no pause, that there is no hesitation. And to that, Justice Leonin replied, um, he's not afraid, but he's chilled. And to me, that doesn't seem logical. But I'm sure you will find a way to explain that in your memoranda.
Justice Scorpio, by the way, is considered an expert in free speech. Um, Professor Molo teaches constitutional and political law in UP and free speech is one of its um, fields of expertise. So uh, that they will be addressing that in the memoranda. Um, going next to the interpolation of Justice Alexander Hismundo, we noticed that they skipped Justice, Justice Benjamin Kagiwa. He was supposed to go next after Justice Leonin, but they went straight to Justice Alexander Hismundo. Um, he grilled on the vagueness, a uh, void for vagueness doctrine. Void for vagueness doctrine essentially means that you're saying that the law is too overbroad, the law is too vague, therefore it is void. Um, the petitioners are saying that because of the very vague definitions of terror under the law, uh, we are all afraid, uh, we are all in under threat of being prosecuted under the law because we don't know what crimes we're going to commit because it's vague, so it should be void. Um, Justice Esmundo said, void for vagueness doctrine will not apply because there is a constitutional right to be informed. So under the constitution, if you are accused of a crime, um, the lawyer is your lawyer is required to explain to you the accusation. If you do not understand the language, the court is required to translate for you what you're being accused of um, before you plead guilty or not guilty. The judge will ask you, do you understand what you're being accused of? And if you're still not satisfied by the clarity of the explanation, you can demand a bill of particulars, which is what Senator um, Juan Ponce Enrile did in his plunder trial. So Justice Esmundo is saying that with all these remedies, with all these explanations being afforded to you, then um, you are informed. You will always have the right to be informed and therefore there is no void for vagueness. And to that, um, uh, Answering that was flag chairperson, Attorney Chel Jokno, who is a veteran litigator in free speech cases. He said that the void for vagueness is different than the right to be informed. Um, right to be informed is a right to be to know what you're being accused of and what you're in trial for. While void for vagueness is uh, refers to the right of every citizen, all of us, to know what the crimes are and for law enforcement to have a clear standard what the crimes are so they know what they're arresting you for it's basically the right of every one of us to know what acts are punishable precisely so we could avoid doing those acts and precisely so we don't reach the point where we are to undergo a trial so that uh there there were also several points raised um by justice mundo including because in the old law if you are acquitted if you were charged of terrorism and you were acquitted the government has to pay you five hundred thousand per day that you were detained that was removed in the anti-terror law so the petitioners are saying that um that is unfair because we no longer have the right to be compensated justice hesmundo said well article 35 of the civil code um enables you to sue for damages if you are wrongly accused so what's what's the problem uh, you still have a right to be compensated uh, that was answered by bangsamoro lawyer attorney algamar latif he said that in the old law it's automatic if you are acquitted there's a set amount of 500,000 pesos and you don't have to do anything else because the only requirement is that you are acquitted uh, they continued in that line of questioning. Justice Ramon Paul Hernando uh, also got the chance to interpolate. He was interpolating on the point of designation. To remind all of you, uh, designation is a power by the Anti-Terror Council to de designate a person or a group of being a terrorist without a full trial. Um, petitioners fear that this will lead to arrests. Justice Hernando said, uh, Designation is just for the purpose of freezing an asset. It will not empower policemen to arrest a designated person. Uh, but Attorney Jokna said, the provision of arrest under the law says you can arrest someone you suspect of committing terrorism. So if someone is already designated as a terrorist, then essentially the policeman can can have a basis to suspect to suspect you of committing terrorism and therefore designation has the effect of being arrested. Um, Attorney Jokno added that the problem is that the Anti-Terror Council, which is made up of cabinet members, they all answer to the president. 
And if the president in a speech tomorrow says person A is a terrorist, then the Anti-Terror Council has no choice but to pursue that person and designate that person as a terrorist, even without due process and even without evidence. Um, Justice Hernandez said that was uh, being speculative. This was the line of questioning it was, and it was getting interesting. But um, Chief Justice Peralta had to cut it because it was already 5.15 and just as the last day, they were determined to finish it on time. So it was time to adjourn. Uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Peralta said that the oral arguments will continue next Tuesday, February 16, wherein they expect all the petitioners to be finished and that they will have time to interpolate also Solicitor General Jose Calida. Uh, before the end of the oral arguments, Chief Justice Peralta issued a warning to the lawyers and to their petitioners not to entertain questions and interviews from media anymore. It was not concretely a gag order, but it has the effect of a gag order because if a Chief Justice says that, then um, understandably the lawyers and the petitioners will no longer grant interviews to the media. So that was what made up day two of oral arguments. Uh, if you still have clarifications, we have a live update page. It's available on rappler.com. Um, the live stream is still available on our website and we will be pushing stories of the oral arguments both day one and day two on our Twitter page. So just follow rappler.com on Twitter and see you next Tuesday for day three and expectedly the final day of the oral arguments on the contentious anti-terror law. Thank you for watching this recap.